Uh, welcome. Um, let me pray for us first, and then we can uh, get to Ezekiel. Uh, so let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the gospel. We thank you that it is one that does not mix with the rest of the world. And I just pray that we may uh, continue to dwell upon it and continue to treasure it and cherish it. And uh, this year that we may all uh, continue to live out the gospel in our own lives, that we may be greater lights and salt in this world. And so we just thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> so as always, we have some discussion questions. We're on Ezekiel 11. Uh, again, Ichabod, Ichabod, part two. Um, two questions, kind of all revolving around the same verse in verse three. You guys look at Ezekiel 11, verse three. There are, there's a saying there. It says, um, the time is not near to build houses. And um, uh, this city is the pot and we are the flesh. Tell me, what do those two phrases mean? All right, what do those two phrases mean? The time is not near to build houses, and the city is the pot, and we are the flesh. So I'll give you guys five to ten minutes to discuss with the people around you. Um, and uh, Paul and Francis, um, would you like to make friends with Renee? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And Josh, would you like to make friends with me? <laughs> yes, yeah, so we'll be around y'all. You guys five to ten minutes. Teammates. <laughs> huh? You can't read. No. Um, I'm helpless. <laughs> um, I can read the book, like, for a while back. Yeah, I read it in a while back, but it's been a while. It's been a hot minute. Yeah. Same. Well, what's it called? I think it's chapter 11. So I read it this morning. I was trying to understand it. But what it seems like, it's like... The Lord gave this prophecy. Um, I can't remember. I know the part of the prophecy was like the Lord, at the end of it, the Lord promises to bring back the remnant. Um, at the end, and but not after he like scatters them. Mm -hmm. So. So like verses 1 through 13 is the judgment. And as Ezekiel is like giving this prophecy, like someone actually like dies before him. And Ezekiel like laments. He says, are you going to get rid of the entire remnant of Israel? And he gives this promise at the end of verses 14 to 25. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but I was thinking that maybe when he says the time is not the time is not near to build houses, it's because they're not going to be there for that long. Like that. Because the part's going to scatter them. Yeah, um, I think uh, I think that's true. Yeah, yeah I agree. I think I do. Why do you have to come here? Come here. 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 I don't know why a pot. <laughs> yeah. There's actually. There's 
There's actually um, a parable later on in Ezekiel, and Ezekiel 24 that talks about the parable of the boiling pot. And so I'm, I'm thinking that it might be very similar and like it's alluding to like the ideas being talked about in Ezekiel 24 about like uh, what is this prophet's Because it's like talking about the pot, you know how you said like, the pot? Yeah, okay. yeah, there's a parable of the boiling pot like right here. What the? Yeah, so it kind of like talks a bit more about kind of like the judgment that um, the city of Jerusalem will face and stuff, um, like in there. So, mm. yeah, I think it's you know very similar to that idea. Do you know what kind of judgment it is? Um, <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like this, it seems like the main part of this parable is right here in verse 13. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Yeah, but it's just like first, like experiencing like God's wrath off the us. Yeah, it's really like getting rid of all like the sin. I see. So I think that's kind of like the same as the spirit of like the city of the spot. Like, yeah, just like God's like wrath and like, being poured on the king of people. Mm. Oh, I guess this is not the time. Yeah, almost like near the flesh. I think it's almost like saying that they're going to be the one to put in the pot. Basically, it's kind of like that same idea of like, oh, yeah, like yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. What? <laughs> I just kind of like spewed out words. Spewed out. So she's fine. Renee, what version are you using? Mm. Okay. Mm. I guess I mean, there's lots of features, right? Like, you would expect it to be more optimistic, right? Like, you know, all the Yeah, yeah. 
<clears throat> I'll give you guys two more minutes. Two more minutes. Two minutes. You want me to count the seconds? One, two, three. Conversations, uh, some a little bit of translation of uh, comparisons there. So that was good. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about all those questions in, in a bit. Um, but today I just wanted to introduce us again to Ezekiel 11. Ezekiel 11. And what we're going to be talking about today, as you guys can see, is just influence. Right? I think this is a particularly neat topic to especially go over today as we're thinking about just the new year and we're thinking about new year's resolutions and what is it that uh we all want to do we all want to glorify the lord we all want to continue to be brighter lights uh, better salt in this world and i think it's really important for us to really think about what is our influence what is our influence in this world what is our influence around with the people around us and how can we be growing in that and being better instruments in the hand of the lord and so this is where we're going to be headed toward. And um, and and before we get into that, I want to just talk about the whole idea of where we're at in Ezekiel at the moment. Ichabod. Does anyone remember what Ichabod means? Ichabod. Yeah, go ahead, Jess. The glory of the Lord has departed. The glory of the Lord has departed. Yes, the glory of the Lord has departed. Remember, uh, we are in a the very end of this giant vision. This giant vision. Does anyone know where this vision started? The temple. The temple, yes. Uh, but in which which uh, which chapter? Sorry. Eight. Eight. Good. Uh, we are in this four chapter um, four chapter vision that started all the way in chapter eight, depicting the departure of the glory of God. That's really what's at, at center stage uh, throughout these four chapters. And remember in chapter 8 how we had the vision of four different idols. We had which ones? Does anyone remember the first one? Tammuz. Uh, Tammuz is one of them, but there's uh, another one that he was shown very uh, The idol of jealousy. Good, the idol of jealousy. And then he was brought closer in, and did the, do you remember what else he saw? Good. Creeping things. Animals, creeping things, and them worshiping them in the back room of the temple. Third was the Tammuz at the very door, at the temple steps. And then fourth was 
sun, sun worship. And we saw how there was this uh, syncretism of Judaism with all the other pagan religions around them, with uh, Tammuz being a Babylonian uh, god of the underworld. Essentially, they were being Satan worshippers. And uh, with the sun worshippers, it was, uh, it was uh, syncretizing with, um, with the Egyptian uh, god Ra. Right? And so we moved on a little bit, and there in chapter 9, we saw five angels of death uh, and one scribe angel to be summoned. And remember how there the one scribe going was going throughout the land and marking off all those who would be a part of the remnant and marking them for salvation who were true believers. And then the other five going about, and they would kill all those without the mark. It was the second, it was a, it was a Passover event. Uh, so to speak. And in chapter 10, we had another vision, and this time it focuses in on the cherubim, and it focuses again on the vision of God's glory. And this time, the glory of God now rose out from its place and was about to ready itself to depart from the temple. And so all of this again, that the, that the glory of God would depart. All right, so now we get into this part two. We get into this chapter 11 here. And chapter 11 is quite interesting. And I want you guys to see first the new but bad vision. There, there's a new vision that that uh, Ezekiel is given. And it starts off in uh, verse 1 of chapter 11. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up. The Spirit now elevates Ezekiel up. We are given... He is now given a greater view of Jerusalem. Where was he before? Or where was he being lifted up out of? Does anyone remember where he's at? The front gate. The front gate. He's at the front gate of the temple. The front door of the temple. And remember, uh, he, he was looking at, or sorry, he was actually in the, in the holy place. And he was looking outside toward eastward, looking at the elders, or sorry, the, the priests, the 25 priests who are worshiping the sun. And now he's been lifted up out of that and given this grand expanding view of the temple of God. And so now the Lord lifts him up. And where does he go? Continuing on, it says, uh, and brought me to the east gate of the Lord's house, which faced eastward. So remember, when we looked at the temple, there's the east temple east temple doors. And then if you move out more toward the courts, you then get the east gate, right? The east gate. And this is where now Ezekiel is put. He, he's put right here. It is here where the Lord wanted to show to Ezekiel yet something new. And it continues on. And behold... And I want to hone in on that word behold, because it says it's essentially this. It means take note of this, right? Take careful consideration of what you are about to see. What, what the spirit of the Lord was about to show Ezekiel is something that is important and one that Ezekiel was not to miss. So what is he about to see? It says this, and behold, there were 25 men at the entrance of the gate and among them I saw Jazaniah, son of Azur, and Pelatiah, son of Benaiah, leaders of the people. Does anyone know who Azur is or Benaiah? Or let's start with Azur. Does anyone know who Azur is? They are not. They are not. But they are considered leaders, kind of. You might know Azur's other son. Uh, his name is Hananiah. Does anyone remember who Hananiah was? The Daniel Hananiah? Not the Daniel Hananiah. Does anyone remember? In another major prophet, definitely in another major prophet. Well, well, let's get into it. There, 25 men are then gathered. And, and Azur here, he is actually the, the father of Hananiah, who is um, written in Jeremiah. 
And what we know about Hananiah when we look at Jeremiah is that Hananiah was a man who opposed Jeremiah. He was a man who opposed Jeremiah. You can read there in Jeremiah. But essentially here, what we have here are 25 elders, right? 25 men. These were the spiritual leaders of Israel. In historical times, it was at this gate that the elders and leaders of Israel would gather. Right? It was the place where the affairs of the city transpired, the place where justice was administered, and where matters were kind of overseen. It was like a courtroom of the day. Day in and day out, the 25 elders there would gather together and preside over the issues of their day. And these 25 men were meant to be the spiritual leaders of their day. Does anyone remember, where's the king then? Where's the king? Does anyone remember where the, where's the king at this point? Who is the king? We can start off with that. Who is the king at this point? Does anyone remember who is the king? Who is the rightful king, I should say? Jehoiah? Kim or Kin? Which Chinese last name is it? <laughs> Kin or Kim? <laughs> Kin? Jehoiah Kin. Jehoiah Kin is the king at this point. But what happened to him? In Babylon? He's in Babylon. So who's in the, the place of Jehoiah Kin? His uncle, his, huh? his uncle Kim? Nope, his uncle Zedekiah. Oh. Zedekiah. Yeah, so his uncle is 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 the king, but we have to understand that the people don't see him really as a king. He's not the rightful king of, of Israel. And so the spiritual leaders at this time really fell upon the elders of those days. Right? And so here these were the men who were the spiritual leaders. Right. With, with the priest, they would be the ones who would be guiding Israel because the people, they didn't really care about Zedekiah. He was just some figurehead that Babylon put up to be their kind of um, to, to be under their thumb. Right. And so these were the people who would lead. These were the people who would have influence. All right. And so these 25 men here, God now puts Ezekiel, look at these men. Right. And this is important. Right. This is what what needed to be seen. The nation of Israel was never going to rise any higher than their spiritual leaders. This is getting down to the root of the issues that God is showing Ezekiel here. This is where it starts. It starts not in those in Israel's pews, but those in Israel's pulpits. Look, God has a high standard on everyone, but the standard is especially important for spiritual leaders. Why? Because spiritual leaders are those who can lead many a people into godliness and holiness due to their own godliness and holiness. But they can also lead many a men into ungodliness and unholiness due to their own ungodliness and unholiness. You see, the reason why God brings Ezekiel here is because this is where it all starts. This is where it all starts. This is where all the idolatry and evil that was being perpetuated all across the land was being formed. Right here. This here is the source. And I want you to think about the narrowness of that source right there. I want you to think about that. To really show the grandeur of this influence. The, the greatness of this influence and this greatness used in a terrible way. Because I want you to think about that and see this. It's just 25 men. It's just 25 men. That's it. 25 men is all it takes. All it takes to lead a whole city of thousands and eventually even a whole nation into spiritual darkness. 25 men. Think about that. All right, friends, if you really want to be a leader... Understand that you have an influence. 
you have an influence. A leader must exhibit an understanding of his influence. You see, that's what we're going to be talking about again about today, influence. What does good influence entail? And what is our attitude toward good influence as well? You know, continuing on in verse in verse one again, God singles out these two people here. Among them, I saw Jasmine, son of Azor, and Pelatai, son of Benaiah, leaders of the people. Azor, his name is brought up briefly in Jeremiah 28.1. And especially in reference to his other son, Hananiah. And when you read in Jeremiah, again, Hananiah was not a, not a great man. He opposed Jeremiah. This right here is not a godly family. Right? And so is the case with Hananiah's brother here, Jazaniah. And Pelatai, son of Benaiah, do we know who any of those two names are? We know of a Benaiah. Remember, he was... Um, he was kind of in David's secret service, but this is not the same Benaiah. And we don't really know which Benaiah this is, and we have never heard of Pelatai either. Right? But all we do know is that these two men, a God calls out particularly as evil influences upon the land of Israel. And what did they do? Uh, Josh, can you read verse 2? Yeah. He said to me, Son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity and give evil advice in this city. And there can be no greater evil put upon a city than for evil advice to be given to it. Because the city will follow the direction of the leaders. Right? And the first thing that I want you guys to notice, an aspect of influence that you see in the negative sense here is counsel. Counsel. What is our counsel? What, what do we use with our, what do we do with our words? One of the greatest blessings that could be given to a nation, to a city, to even an individual is one is when someone gives you good advice. Right. And that's what really one of the greatest blessings that you can, that you can be given. Right. And just think about it. Our, our elders, Dave and then pastor Chris there, how, they've given us, fantastic counsel and it has always turned out for for our good right and following that is not not a blessing upon our lives right isn't that not uh putting us on the right path of holiness and one in which we continue to stick uh put holiness to, up to the greatest pursuit of our lives right one of the greatest again greatest blessings is when god puts within your within your path, men and even women who will chart a course of godliness for your life. But on the flip side here, it's a reminder that what is that which is of greatest good can also become that which uh, is the worst of evils. Because the greatest evil is when an individual is re uh, reputable and honorable and yet gives you bad advice and counsel. Right. I, th I think here's a reminder that leadership is important and we better take leadership seriously, especially if we want to be leaders ourselves. Because here's the thing. If you give someone counsel, guess what? You can be altering their life. Is that not true? You could literally be altering the trajectory of their life. And that's something that I think for all of us, it's something for us to consider because if we want to be a leader, if we want to be men and women who actually have an influence on those around us and a good influence at that, then we have to recognize and be fearful that our counsel can lead people in a certain direction. And we hope that is a direction of godliness and holiness. Right? One of the most powerful influences is, in fact, our counsel. Is our counsel one that is pointing others toward God? Right? Is our counsel one that is pushing others toward holiness? Or is it one that is lowering the bar? One that gets other people to have an excuse for more and more sin or more unwise and worldly living. And I think here's a reminder. Be careful with the advice you give to others. Think through it yourself. Have it be one that you also, yourself, 
apply into your life and that you can be the example of the blessings that following after principles can get you. All right, look, you're not just giving your opinion. You're not just giving your thoughts. We can't be careless with words, especially as a leader whose words hold weight. And I think, especially today, what I want to remind us is that words are important. Words are important. Right, because I think when we look at our culture around us, words don't really hold any more weight today. We we really diminish the weight of words, right? Especially when we think that oh, words can just mean however you want, right? When people look at even God's word, they say, oh, I can just be the interpreter of this because again, what they're saying is words don't mean anything. Or in fact, we can even look at our own lives and we when we see the application of of whether we take words seriously. When, when we say one thing that sounds bad and we can say, oh, I, I didn't really mean that. Right. That is lowering what your word really means. I didn't mean it that way. But guess what? When we look at scripture, it's out of the mouth. It's out of the heart that the mouth speaks. Does it not? Is it not? Our words do matter. And it matters to God. In fact, God's word matters. Right, one of the most important things about us is our words. It's what we say and, and how we say it, too. Right? It's there where people see our character. It's there that people see who we are. It's there that we will essentially, where we will hold ourselves up to the high standard. Right? Be men and women of our word, is it not? Right? If you say, then you will do. Right, and what's one of the things in, in the Sermon on the Mount? Is it not where it says, let your yes be yes and your no, no? Words are important, and God cares about our words. He cares about our speech. He cares about what we say. And so here, especially as a leader, we must look after the culture of our tongue. We must look after what it goes on in our mouth. Right? And so when we look at this especially, I want you guys to see this. What was their counsel exactly? We can, so we get to verse 3 now. These, these men here, these leaders, they say, who say, the time is not near to build houses. Now, I know we had a fun little discussion about that, but what does that mean? The time is not near to build houses. Does anyone want to take a guess? Michael? I'm looking at you. I'm lost on this one, Grant. Uh, you're lost. Okay. No worries. No worries. Does anyone want to help out Michael? Help out Michael. He needs the wisdom. He wants to get married. Guys, help him. <laughs> Please. <laughs> can I say it according to the King James? Yeah, you can. Okay. So King James says, which say it is not near, let us build houses. So the, the bad, the wicked council says, which is not, which say it is not near, let us build houses. Mm -hmm. So when I read that, not knowing that I need a piece of something different, I thought their, their wicked council was, you're not going to get judged, so let's build houses. Judgment's not coming. Yeah, yeah. So, so there is a lot of debate actually with this verse because uh, they don't know where uh, what that not is pointing to. So the not there in in King James version is saying the time is not near, so let's build houses, right? Or is it this is not we do not build houses now, right? And so there's the one interpretation of it, and both and whichever one that you take, they both lead you to the same exact uh, same exact uh, conclusion. But we'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. But re, what Renee is saying is that for them, uh, they were saying, if it is, this is not the time to build, or this is the time to build houses. What they were saying is, let's settle. This is the place, right? This is the place of uh, where we're not going to leave our land. Let's just build a house and dwell here, right? So that's one way that we can take it. But what's the other way that, what's another way that we can take it? Does anyone else have any other thoughts to that? When you take it the other way, this is not the time to build houses. Wait, what was the first one? What was the not? The not would be in, in King James Version. It would be uh, along the lines of um, uh, the time 
is not near. So let's build houses. Isn't that the same for the other temptation? No, because when you look at ESV or NASB, it is uh, it's saying the time is not near to build houses. So essentially, with the first one, with King James, it's saying let's build houses. And second, it's saying um, uh, let's not build houses. But both are saying in the very beginning, the time is not near. Sorry, does that make sense? Interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is the time though? Can we can we can we try to at least narrow that down? What is the time? Judgment. judgment. Good. The time that's referring to is judgment. So when it's saying not near to build houses, what's the what does anyone have any ideas as to what that means? Anyone want to take a guess? There is enough time for them to save Israel. There's enough time for the, what? How do you relate that to the houses part? No idea. <laughs> Go ahead, Jess. Um, there's like really no point in building a house because it's going to get destroyed anyways. But they're saying the exact opposite. Oh, they are? Yeah. Oh, okay. They're saying the judgment is not about to come. So, oh, are we talking about the King James version? Oh, no. Oh. Sorry. We're talking about the NASB version. No. Oh, never mind. All right. Judgment is not near. So what they're saying is judgment is not near, so let's not build houses. I would go with the NASB version, by the way. <laughs> after after doing a, some some review, but well, we can talk about that after. Why would anyone say let's not build houses? Because the judgment is not coming. <laughs> right what so well, let's let's get into this just a little bit why bring up houses what's what's the point of all of that right it's like it, it almost sounds like a different subject matter it's like you walk into a math class and the teacher starts teaching you grammar which does happen actually when you're a math major sadly <laughs> and uh but why this well well again there's two ways that some will look at it one is that the leaders were counseling the people to build houses to protect themselves from Nebuchadnezzar, right? So some people will say, oh, we don't need to build houses because, because uh, people were saying build houses so that we can protect ourselves from Nebuchadnezzar. We can protect ourselves from Babylon. But when you think about it, how are, act how are houses actually going to protect people from an oncoming attack, right? Houses don't serve the purpose of defense. The walls do. Um, so the, I don't think that that's necessarily what uh, the meaning here is for. But I do think this links very well to Jeremiah verse 24, 20, chapter 29, verse 4 to 5. And let's let's flip there real quick. Jeremiah 29, 4 to 5. Tim, can you read that for us? Yeah. yeah. Jeremiah 29? Yeah, 29, verse 4 to 5. 29 verse 4 to 5. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their produce. Yes. So I would say it references it back to here. Right. And the idea of building houses is that these are the exiles who will go there and they will build houses and make a living and make a place of Make, make a place of uh, where, where they can just plant essentially some roots, right? And, and this lines up essentially very, they're commanded to build houses for the one fact is that they don't have houses. They don't have anywhere to live. And it reminds us of Exodus just a little bit. Does anyone remember that feast that celebrates their time in the wilderness? Booths, the Feast of Booths. Uh, does anyone know the other name? Feast of, well, booths, tab, tents, tabernacles, tents. <laughs> the, the whole idea, remember, with that feast was that they were celebrating their time uh, there because it reminded them they were constantly building houses. They were constantly building uh, a place of refuge, a place where they could call home. They were constantly building houses and taking them down where when they were just nomads in the wilderness. Building houses to them was a sign that they were not in their home. Building houses was a sign that they were not in their home. 
And what the leaders of, of Ezekiel's day were essentially saying was that the time is not near to build houses. The time is not near that, that they will not be, they will find themselves not in their home. Right? Essentially what they meant was that judgment was not coming. Right? And in essence, what they were doing was that they had a complete disregard for the word of God. Right? God was saying, judgment, judgment, judgment. My wrath is now here. Discipline is on the horizon. And the people of Israel were saying, eh, I don't believe it. They were told disregard of all that God had said previously. And you want to talk about counsel and what it looks like to not take counsel wisely. This right here is not taking counsel wisely. Right? Essentially, bad counsel is, is simply ungodly counsel. It is counsel that goes against the very word of God and is counsel that doesn't heed the word of God. It is counsel that doesn't take a good counsel. Right, and they double down on this because what they say next in verse three is this: the city is the pot, and we are the flesh. Does anyone? I think this one's a, a tad on the easier end, but does anyone know what this one means, too? The city is the pot, and we are the flesh. Hmm. The good stuff. Is it what? Never <laughs> mind. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I think you're on something. I wasn't sure if, like, do the leaders think, like, oh, like, they think they're so great? Like, like, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, 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 keep going. You're, you're getting I somewhere. Know, I don't know, like, um, I wasn't sure if, like, okay, well, in my mind, meat is great, so, <laughs> so I guess, like, it's, like, I don't know if they thought they were like precious stuff or like, you know, like kind of, yeah, like the prize thing. And so, and like Jerusalem is like, okay, yeah. Then, yeah, do you get what I mean? I, I do get what you mean. I do get what you mean. And, and you're on to something. You, you definitely are. Does anyone else want to add a little bit more flavor to that? A little bit more salt? A little some spices? <laughs> is that like a cooking thing about like the pot and then they're like flesh in the pot okay yeah they are the flesh in the pot but what are they trying to get at here what's the big picture why are you using this analogy all right let, let's let's talk about it so let's let's talk about it. The, the analogy they used is, of course, of a cauldron and meat. Uh, seems to mean that you put in the cauldron what is the best of the best, right? When you're cooking, you don't save the worst parts for yourselves, right? You don't throw in like I don't know what are the worst parts of of of, of flesh, toes and fingers. Uh, there you go. <laughs> See, worst parts, worst parts. Right, you, you have the best. You have you have the drumsticks, right? You have the dark meat. You have the the, the chicken breast. You you throw that in there, right? The waste parts of the butchered animal were already taken away, but the best are left in the cauldron. Right? They were essentially saying that they were safe inside of the pot. They were safe inside of the pot because God had saved up the best and kept them in Jerusalem. Right again. How many times was how many times before this moment was Israel deported into Babylon? How many deportations are there? Three There's three total. Does anyone remember what years? Five eighty six is the last. Five eighty six <laughs> is the last. Certainly. Five seventy four. Wait, you're going the other way. Oh, that's right. <laughs> 5, 597. 597 is not the first. It's the second. Yeah. 
Uh, that's the first one. So there's already been two deportations into Babylon, right? By the time that Ezekiel is writing. Remember, Ezekiel was part of the second one in 597. And so what the people were saying is, oh, they were just the, the waste parts of the animals, right? But the best parts, we are the flesh. Well, we're, we're the good stuff. God is now sa has saved us and kept us into the, in the pot of Jerusalem, right? And, and I, I want you guys to see this because they, what they were essentially saying is that they were safe inside of the pot. They were safe inside of Jerusalem. Do you know what's worse than someone who is wrong? Someone who insists on their wrongness, someone who says they're right even when they're wrong. Right? When people stick to their wrong thinking, especially leaders, it's it's dangerous. And this is exactly what they're doing. They're they're sticking to their guns. They're they're doubling down on it and providing even more implication and saying, Oh, you know, the time is not for judgment. And on top of that, oh, but we're the best of the best. Right? And this is what dangerous, what is dangerous to influence. Like you can look mighty confident in wrong thinking. You can even double down on stupidity. But do you know what can only help your influence? Being teachable. Being willing to listen to right thinking and having a desire ultimately pointed not in making yourself look good, but in making God look good. Look, a section like this shows much about the leaders of Israel's day. They were proud in their ignorance. Pride is a dangerous force when mixed with influence. A leader's influence is then to bring people to themselves and not to bring people to God. That's what was going on in their thinking. Right? It's a reminder to, for us that pride and biblical leadership, leadership make terrible roommates. Pride will only frustrate biblical leadership and could potentially even kick it out of the house and disqualify a man from ministry. What ought to be our response to good counsel? Be teachable. Even when you are in leadership, even when you have influence over others, be willing to learn yourself. Be willing to look, at, look to men and other women for counsel yourself that you can help them. Right, in your discipleships, in your small groups, with those who you are taking care of, be teachable and be willing to take the counsel of others to provide as well wisdom for you in approaching your leadership. So what is Ezekiel to do? What is Ezekiel to do? Verse 4, therefore prophesy against them. Son of man, prophesy now two times ezekiel is told to prophesy in other words take a deep breath puff out that chest lift up that voice and cry out thus says the lord if there is anything that talks about how much god cares about our words is it not that that ezekiel's influence was to then put out that word of God. Right? That was that was what Ezekiel was to do. How do you combat bad advice? How do you dispel bad counsel? It's not rocket science. You give good counsel. Right? Again, does that not show the influence of the power of influence through our counsel? The correction to bad counsel is good counsel. And Ezekiel is to be that force to keep on prophesying, to be that voice in the wilderness and give out God's word when the other 25 men would not. Ezekiel was to fight fire with fire here and to give them his word. No, not his word, God's word. And he was to speak. He was to shout. He was to prophesy. He was to give them God's word. All right, it's a reminder. Where is our counsel based from? Where is it grounded on? Is it grounded on experience? Is it grounded on those things that are so subjective in this world? Or is it grounded on actual objectivity found in the foundation that is God's word? I think here, what we see here is that 
the greatest thing that you can do for someone else is when you prophesy. It's not, I'm not talking about in the sense of, oh, I have this vision from the Lord and what he tells me in five, five out in five minutes, 10, 15, actually, no, in 30 minutes, this lesson is going to be over, <laughs> right? It's not that, right? It's essentially, God. it's not foretelling, it's forth telling, tell God has already said. So moving on, verse 15. The old but good prophecy. What was the message? Continuing on in verse 5. It fell upon me. Right? It fell upon him. That is emblematic of the power of the Holy Spirit gripping him and moving him to speak that which the Lord was giving him. Remember, we are unable and incapable of to speak any word from God unless God gives it. Divine wisdom cannot be conjured up within the heart of the sinner's heart. It needs to be given and illuminated in the heart through the power of the Spirit. And continuing on, and he said to me, say, thus says the Lord. This is a familiar signature of the prophet. 3,800 times is this phrase or its equivalent said. Thus says the Lord. And he says, thus says the Lord, so you think, house of Israel, for I know your thoughts. God starts here. The problem starts first and foremost with their mind. As a man thinks within his heart, so is he. Ultimately, you aren't what you think you are. Rather, what you think you are. And really, everything in your life is simply an acting out of what is in your mind. Right? For example, when you say to someone, and you make some plans with them, and you say, oh, well, I forgot. You know what that means? That means you're empty-headed. And that, do you know what else that means? That means you didn't really care in the first place. Right? Here, everything is acted out upon what goes on in the mind. That is the center of who you are as a man and as a woman. The center of man is not his emotions. That's one of the most shallow parts about you. It's your thoughts. Your thoughts are what is the deepest part about you and God is going after the thoughts of these men he knows what is in the mind of men those dark corners which men may not know God knows and so God says in verse 6 you have multiplied your slain in the city filling its streets with them these leaders have been responsible for the murder of righteous men good men people who probably opposed them and were then hence slain. And God says that he has seen how they have mowed down men more righteous than they. Was it not Israel who slayed their, her own prophets? Israel had a knack of silencing the influence of those who were for the Lord. Look throughout all those times. Yeah, definitely men. There were uh, there were there weren't that many men who worked for God. But that's for two reasons. Because men like that are rare. But also, too, the men who did rise up were often killed. And so God has a word for them in verse 7. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, your slain among you have laid in the midst of the city are the flesh. And this city is the pot, but I will bring you out of it. It's a play on words with the metaphor from before. Those that you slayed were the flesh. In other words, they were the best meats of the butchered meats. Right? And you, you, oh, you guys are the waste. You guys are those that I'm going to leave out of the cauldron. They will not find any protection due to the city, and God will bring them out. They will be those pieces that no one wants in their stew, and they will be thrown out. They found security in their city, but God will now take them out of that and that's exactly what verses 8 to 10 tells us. It says, you have feared a sword, so I'll bring a sword upon you, the Lord declares. And I will bring you out of the midst of the city and deliver you into the hands of strangers and execute judgments against you. You will fall by the sword. I will judge you to the border of Israel. In other words, they will Jerusalem, so you shall know that I am the Lord. God is going to take the sword and bring it to the leader's feet and to their head. He's going to kill each of them in the way that none of them wish they would die. Right? I think here, 
what we see is that these leaders, they learn the hard way of who God actually is. Right? It took something like this for them to finally give attention to God. They disregarded God, disregarded God's counsel. And it will take their destruction for them to finally realize they done messed up, making God and his word something so killed. So uh, this is for your own notes. This actually does come to pass in 2 Kings 25, 18 to 21, where the leadership there is slain outside of Jerusalem. Verse 12. Thus you will know that I am the Lord, for you have not walked in my statutes, nor have you executed my ordinances, but have acted according to the ordinances of the nations around you. This right here is the point of departure. This is the crack in the dam. This is where the first cancer cell came from. This is the small yet deadly force that brought an end of a nation. Friends, we're talking about influence today, and need I remind you that you're never going to push people any higher than you are. Those people look not just at your words, they look at your life. It's not just your counsel that people look at, it's your conduct. It's your conduct. But here's the point. They didn't walk in God's statutes. Instead, they acted according to the ordinances of the other nations around them, as verse 12 tells us. But all of it that God was saying is, look at what you are, what you do. Look, you influence others with your conduct. And I think we easily forgot, forget that. What does your conduct say about you? And here's the thing. Is it a conduct that you want others to imitate? I think that's an important question. Look, I remember, I think maybe four or five years ago. I don't know, so something like that. When I was in college, oh man, that was a long time ago. When I was in college, I was thinking about dating. Yes, I was thinking about dating. And I remember receiving counsel from, uh, from a man, and he said to me, Raymond, would you be willing to let your daughter date a man like you? And that got me thinking, because that's really what it's all about. When you really think about it, would you want the people around you to be like you? Would you want the people around you to really act the way that you act? Right? Is your life one worth imitating? I, I've, I've talked to some, some of the parents at my parents' church at times, and they, they sometimes tell me, oh, I don't want my kids to turn out like me. Oh, that, that's not good, guy. Truly one where you uphold the standard of Scripture to such a high degree that you will change your life due to it. Now, you, you will do everything in your power to make sure that nothing in your life will be a hindrance to the gospel at hand. Let me say this. If you care about your influence, then you're not free to do what you want, when you want, under the guise of Christian freedom. Look, many things are permissible, but not all things are profitable. And sometimes those, th sometimes those things that are permissible will do more harm than good. They will look more like worldly living than godly living look we may not be so quick to put ourselves into places of sin i think we know that i think we know that right don't sin that's that's an easy one but here's another question do we put our, ourselves in places of temptation now that's a different question right places where we can slide further down into sin and that's the trouble and that's what I want to think about in our own influence. In our in own influence, are you putting yourself in, in 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 trouble? Are you putting your conduct in a place where you can be be enraptured to want to be more like the world? Look, going to a bar, just simply walking into a bar, is not a sin by the mere act. But guess what? It certainly makes you look awfully like the world, does it not? 
it certainly puts you in a place of temptation, does it not? It's perhaps one of the most unwise things and goes against the Lord's prayer itself, where we ought to pray, lead me not into temptation. Look, the Lord's prayer does not tell us to pray this, lead me not into sin. No, it doesn't say that. It says, lead me not into temptation. We are to hate sin, but we all we ought not to want to even walk on the road that leads to it either. So again, can I ask us, what does our actions say of us? All right, the problem with Israel here was that they didn't look, they didn't obey the ordinances and the statutes of the Lord. They instead obeyed the ordinances and statutes of the world. Look, the world or God? That's an important question. Look, is your life looking interestingly similar to the world? If, if it is, can I say something perhaps needs to change, needs to be done? But how? What does the text tell us? They didn't walk in the statutes of God. You want to be a good influence for the Lord? You want to be a witness for God? Being a witness isn't about being nice. I really want to get that across. Being a witness is not about being nice. We conflate niceness and witness and, and, and influence together all the time. As long as we are nice, we are doing something for the Lord, right? No, that's not a witness. Since we're talking about it, isn't a greater witness to not go to a bar? I've heard people say that. How else am I going to talk to them and be a good friend to them? That's not your purpose for being a witness. Your purpose for being a witness is so that you can show that God is indeed alive within you. It's to show that you truly have one master, the Lord himself. Right? It's not our main goal to be nice. It's not our main goal to get other people to like us. That's not what witness and influence is. It's about showing people that you believe that God indeed exists and notice there is a difference. When we obey God, it shows that God is alive. And that's the thing. When we are alive in God, then God is alive in us. Right? I, I think that's the thing that we need to remind ourselves of. When people look at you, do they see God to be alive? When people look at you, when they see you, and they see the way that you live, do they say, wow, that looks different because I can see this is someone who actually believes that God is real and that God is true and that what he says matters. So what happens next is that God seals everything that he's about to do with a sign. Verse 13. Now it came about that as I prophesied that Pelatiah, son of Benaiah, died. One of the leaders just dropped down dead. Right, that's going to get your attention, does it not? Right, when the head leader is struck down right away in an act of judgment as you are prophesying, that's going to really leave a mark in your head, does it not? Understand, God is making a point here. He's making a point of who's in charge and who is not. These leaders, they might have led you, Israel, but they are not God's leaders, and they certainly do not speak for God and speak in place of God either. God is not playing wiffle ball here. He's playing hardball. And even Ezekiel would fall uh, on his face and cry out with a loud voice in verse 13. Alas, Lord God, will you bring the remnant of Israel to a complete end? Right? By seeing this, he's seeing judgment is coming. It is near. And it's scary. Right? And so we get now get into this lasting words. Lasting words. Listen to God's word in verse 14 and 15. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, verse 15, Son of man, your brothers, your relatives, your exiles, and the whole house of Israel, all of them are those to whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Go far from the Lord. This land has been given us as a possession. How many groups of Jews do you see in this section? Uh, overarching groups. There's, there's two. Oh, I guess four, if you want to count man, your brother, relatives, and all those. But uh, I'm mainly looking at two. 
When you look at uh, brothers, relatives, fellow exiles, that's all one group. These are the, those around Ezekiel. These are those who are with him in exile. Right, and these are those whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said. So you get that? Those in Jerusalem are saying of those in the exile. So two main groups of Jews here. And they say to them, go far from the land. This land has been given us as a possession. Right, the idea here is that those in Jerusalem, again, thought they were better. They thought they were the superior Jew. God kept them in the land while the others were taken off to exile. But in many ways, it was the opposite. Those in captivity were those who were being humbled. Those who were learning the hard way that the Lord desires repentance and desires a contrite heart. Those who would contemplate, contemplate their life and contemplate all that they did to the Lord. Right, those were the ones who God had an eye out for. So, here, the inhabitants in Jerusalem, the inhabitants there, would continue to move on from bad to worse because they didn't have that push to want to dwell on their life. Right? They were the ones who gave into the idol of jealousy. They were the ones who gave into the idols of creeping things. They were the ones who invited taboos and invited uh, the, the, the worship of the sun into their own home. It was there that idolatry reigned. Again, they had it all wrong. In many ways, those in exile were better off so that they could dwell and consider their relationship to the Lord in poverty. While those in wealth did not even care. And look what is said next. And, and this is absolutely remarkable. right? What we see next are, are a few words. And I really want to ask this. Have we seen any word of restoration yet in the book of Ezekiel? Have we seen any sort of restoration that God has promised to the, to the nation of Israel? Not really. We, we, we've seen maybe a, a hint at remnants, but as far as restoration of the land, the restoration as far as nation, as, as far as Israel as a nation, we have not seen that yet. What is promised to those in exile, verse, verse, thir, verse 16, it says, Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, though I had removed them far away among the nations, and though I had scattered them among the countries, yet... And get this, I was a sanctuary for them a little while in the countries where they had gone. What is promised to those in exiles? God is promised to those in exile. Do you see the irony here? It was only a captivity when they were away from the promised land, when they were away from Jerusalem, when they were away from the temple of God, when they were away finally from all of that. Then they finally met God. You get, you get the irony there? The sanctuary of God was in Jerusalem, yet God remained a sanctuary to them. And there is another promise to those in exile in verse 17. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries among which you have been scattered. And I will give you the land of Israel. All right, what was the other promise that was given to them? It was the land of Israel. That was a great promise. In verse 18, when they come there, they will remove all its detestable things and all its abominations from it. When they come back to this land, there will no longer be any idols. They will remove all kinds of idolatry. No more idol of jealousy. No more idol of creeping things. No more Tammuz and no more sun worship. All right, and this was fulfilled in one sense. When they came back, but in the ultimate sense, it is yet to be revealed. But moving forward, we get not just the outward circumstances of everything, but we also see the internal change with this new restoration. Verse 19, and I'll give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. And I'll take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. 
that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. Then they will be my people, and I shall be their God. This right here is a promise of regeneration. Does this sound any like anything familiar to you guys? What does it sound like? QTD. QTD? Good. But what's there in the QTD? Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, which is? What is that overarching? What is that over? What is that called? The new covenant. The new covenant. Right here, it's not called a covenant given to them. That will come later in Ezekiel 36, and we will find that also in Jeremiah 31. But this is the promise of the new covenant, is it not? The word covenant again, it's not mentioned. But this is the new covenant. And it is the only saving covenant. Right? And God is saying, I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. It's a work of regeneration. It's a work of restoration. And what is being regenerated here, ultimately, not the nation of Israel. Ultimately, not, not that they come back. Not that, they, that he will be their God. But ultimately, what is regenerated is their heart. Right, that is what it takes center stage here. It's that God cares about the heart. In fact, when we think about influence, understand that our last aspect of influence is our character. Character, 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 like we like to say here. Right, when we talk about influence, character is perhaps the most important aspect about our influence. Right, because it's that that undergirds our counsel. It is that which undergirds our conduct. Right, understand you will never be able to influence others to be greater than you are because how are they going to listen to you if they if you don't even listen to you? Right? How are they to act in a different way if you don't even act in the way that you say? And that's why it was Robert Murray McShane. He was a pastor in Scotland who once said, the greatest need of my people is, how do you think he felt it? He said this, the greatest need of my people is this, my personal holiness. My personal holiness. Right, that's what he understood it took to be a pastor. It took to, it took to be an elder. That well, the most important thing he could do for others was to look after his own heart and to look after his own character. God cares about character. That's the most important thing to him. Remember, when he looked at David, right, what did he say? What did Samuel say? God does not look at outward appearance like man does. Right, but he looks at the heart. He looks at the heart, and this right there, David was a man after God's own heart. Right? Robert Murray McShane would often say this, my per or, the greatest need of my people is my personal holiness. And he would often be found praying, Lord, make me as holy as a pardoned sinner can be. To that, McShane would often assert, your whole, whole usefulness depends on this. Your whole usefulness depends on your character. Do you get that? Do you understand that? And do you believe that? Your whole use, usefulness in this world depends on your own heart and your own character. Right? I want you to see this. Our influence doesn't just influence the people around us. It doesn't just influence those in the world. It doesn't just influence those in, in church. But can I also say this i say this i know it's going to sound weird it influences god our character influences god right you know we can talk about that influencing others but i really want to focus in on here do you realize that we have an influence on god yes god is sovereign you know i i get that and we will never make god change his mind Right? And he will never do something that he does not want to do either. But we do influence God, do we not? Right, The prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much, right? 
right? The prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. God cares about the character. It's the prayers of the, him who is righteous in which he will ordain not just the ends and the end result, but he re, uh, ordains the means through which he will work. And God will always, or God loves to ordain the means of a righteous and good character of a man to use him for his purposes. Right, with godly character, God is going to bless that, right? Right, God is going to act in blessing over a man with good character. He's going to act in cursing with a man of bad character. Right, that was the Mosaic Covenant, was it not? Right, God, in one sense, is influence, ordains that within his own sovereignty by by the man with godly character. Remember the words of 2 Chronicles 16, 9, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. God loves to use the man of good character, the man of, of cleanliness and heart, of moral purity. And he is looking for those men. He's looking for those women. And he wants to use them and work through them. Friends, can I ask this? Do you want a life where God works through you and where it's evident that God wants to use you? Do you make yourself appetizing to God that he can just pick you up and use you? All right, because here it's a reminder for us. God focuses again. On the heart, he focuses in on the character. And if you want to be used mightily for the Lord, if you want to be used, uh, be used in ways that uh, will really benefit His kingdom and push His kingdom forward, then the first and foremost place is that God is not going to pick up a man who has absolutely dirt in his life. No, He's going to use a man of good character. He's going to be a. He's going to use a man who will actually pay attention to what he says. All right, look at the verse again, verse 19 to 20. And I'll give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. And I'll take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Take note of the next of this next word, that. That they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. Then they will be my people and I will be their God. When, whenever there is a root in the Lord, there is going to be the fruit of obedience. There will always be a fruit of a holy walk. Counsel and conduct can only come out of good character. You want to up your influence? It's not about more opportunities. It's about more character. Right? Is that not it? If you want to be used more mightily, if you want to be able to use your spiritual gifts more effectively, it is about what your character is. Right? Is that not the elders as well? When you think about eldership, right? God doesn't look for the most gifted man. He looks for the most godly man. Right? And that's the point here. It's godliness that will be, and it's our character that will broaden our opportunities to serve him and to be used by him. Right? I think that's the important part. The more character that you grow and develop, the more opportunities that will come your way to be able to serve the Lord. Because God loves to use the man and the woman who, is, who puts him first in their heart. Right? Is that not why he used David? All right, friends, do you live a life that, that God would want to use? Do you live a life that God will want to work through? God loves the man with great character, and to the man who has much character, he will give much opportunities. But to the one who does not, well, look at verse 20, 21. But as for those whose hearts go after their detestable things and abominations, I will bring their conduct down on their heads, declares the Lord God. And at the end of the day, God will destroy those whose hearts are not with him. Even the unrighteous influence, 
un, even the unrighteousness influences God in one way, does it not? It influences God to bring his wrath upon them. Right? They bring God's wrath. Who are these? This is not those who are in captivity and exile. These are those in Jerusalem. And you want to see how character influences the Lord in one sense? Just look at the negative example in verses 22 to 25. It says this. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of God of Israel turned over them. The glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood over the mountain, which is east of the city. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God to the exiles in Chaldea. So the vision that I had seen left me. Then I told the exiles all the things that the Lord had shown me. What happens here? The Lord leaves. The last word God gives before his departure is a word of promise. And I want you guys to understand that. Ichabod, Ichabod is written all over the temple doors. It's written all over Jerusalem. But what God cares about, what God continues to do is that he continues to have this promise to Israel that they will be restored. Right? I think the thing that we need to realize here is that when we look at this, it is a sad event, but there is a message of hope. Because where is the Lord glory, the Lord headed? We will talk about this the very first week. What's east of Jerusalem? Babylon. All right, that's where he wants to be with his people. All right, east of the sea. All right, he's going to be where they will be with those who are truly sorrow. That's the picture of what it looks like. When a character, when God wants to use the man of character, he wants to be with those of good character. And that right here was those in exile. All right, look at these points again. And I want you to see this right here. The first or second or third aspect of, of influence, I didn't say the first, second, or third aspect of good influence. I really want to get at that. Why? Because counsel, conduct, and character can also be used of bad influence. And what I want you to realize today is that as you guys go about in your lives, as you guys go about, can I just say that perhaps a good New Year's resolution is one where we can really look after these three things, counsel, conduct, and character. Because these are the three things that we all have. If it's good or not, that's up to you. All right, and so with that, keep that in mind. We all have an influence in this world. Whether you want it or not, God has given you the influence because you are where you're at, and people will be looking at you. People will be seeing how you live. Do you show that God is one to be alive? So with that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can dwell upon our own lives and really live a life that can be pleasing to you. Father, I pray that we may all desire and, and that we may all be that man and that woman who you would want to use. Father, I pray that our character may continue to grow throughout this next year and throughout the rest of our lives and that we may really put a premium on that. And so may we continue to go on growing. May we continue to go on learning. And may we keep going on and applying. And in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So next time, read chapters 12 and 13. And we will be here, I think, next week as well. Uh, so a little bit over time. Uh, but if I can have all the men help in reorienting the room in its proper place, that would be helpful. So thank you, guys.